Okay. Well, uh, we're, we're close here to noon, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get, get started. Um, welcome to everyone who has joined us thus far. It looks like there might be some more people trickling in here, but I'll go ahead and uh, use this opportunity to thank our sponsors for the Small Firms Roundtable for 2021. They are Mend Services, Syntex Sash and Door, and Knight Construction. We are very grateful to all three of them for their financial support. Um, it's, been, it's been a year, another one. Uh, we're, we're kind of, I guess, three quarters of the way through here. Um, but we've had some great programming, and, and this, I think, promises to be a very interesting conversation today as well. And we'll have a few more um, sessions through to close out 2021. Um, so with that, I am going to kind of introduce sort of our, our, our featured guests, if you will. Uh, but I do want to make a note that I, I would like for this to be more of a conversation with everyone that is participating today, if you're, if you're willing to share. Uh, just because I think the more perspectives on this topic, uh, the better. So this is not necessarily a presentation per se, but more just a forum for being able to kind of address this question of how much do you draw? So uh, with us today, we've got Scott, Scott Magic, who is actually my co-chair for the Small Firm Roundtable this year uh, of Magic Architecture. And we've got Brett Grieg who is a project manager with Rouser Construction, but also, as many of you know, uh, a licensed architect and has, has worked both as an architect and now uh, as, uh, well, on the contracting side with, uh, with Eric Rouser. And so uh, she brings a unique perspective to this question simply because she has kind of been on both sides of the coin. Um, and, and I think we'll have a lot of interesting things to say about this subject. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to kind of pose the question and the concept of, of what Scott and I were discussing relative to this, to this presentation. Um, and it's just kind of the old question, how, how much do you draw uh, as an architect creating construction documents to be executed in the field? whether they be for a residential project or a commercial project. Uh, this question is fraught with nuance, with uh, complexity, with liability, uh, with, with all kinds of, of um, descriptors. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the scale of projects, the type of projects, all of those things come into play, uh, as everyone here knows. And it's, I think it's an, an interesting question to pose to everyone and to see sort of where we are collectively, maybe right now as, as, as a profession um, in, in terms of what we're producing uh, for our construction documents. So um, we've got Scott who kind of has, his firm is sort of firmly planted in commercial projects mostly, although he does uh, do residential projects as well. Brett is, is more from the residential side of things. Um, and so I guess, Scott, maybe, you know, we'll kind of start with you in terms of, I don't know, you've, you've got some interesting uh, sort of, I guess, concepts through which you've been uh, well, or maybe different lenses through which you've been looking at this question. One of which, what is our why, or well, what is our responsibility as a profession, uh, kind of a, as a minimum best practices standard? Uh, who sets that? Who sets that limit or that minimum standard? And and are we, you know, collectively being successful at, at meeting our our minimum goals? And then we can kind of get into, you know, who's going above and beyond those minimum standards, or or not meeting those standards. I'm going to open up the floor to you. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, if everyone could uh, mute their mics, maybe I'm, I'm getting some noise. Uh, well, I mean, this conversation started, uh, there's actually a published uh, occupational requirement on the Texas uh, website about how architects are responsible for drawing certain things. You're like, oh, crap, I, I guess I better read this. Um, 
but also it came from a conversation with uh, a friend of mine, uh, David Erickson, who who left Lake Flato uh, a few months ago, and he he was complaining about, oh, I'm so tired of working on house house sets that have hundreds of pages. Like we don't need to draw a house set that has a hundred pages. We can do it in six sheets. And I was like, I show me, show me how you can do that today. I mean, I'd love to see a set of drawings that explained all the level of detail and all the alignments and all your uh, capital A architecture on six sheets. I go, I, I've, been, I've been witness to too many people assuming that the detail was shown in the drawings and then either not get it or have their work um, get very difficult with a contractor and, and try to uh, uh, pressure the contractor to fix things for misinterpreting the intent. And so it's oftentimes like, uh, that's the battle, right? Yeah. Your, your drawings are there. I mean, uh, my favorite line was, uh, from an architect in Oregon. He said, your drawings are just advice. No one has to follow them. They don't. I mean, and, and so a lot of it comes down to what what's your contract, right? Or or what who who's building uh, yeah. for you? So um, it, it's always that kind of question, like how much do you draw, and and what level of detail? Um, but I'd love to I'd love to hear Brett, you know, Brett talk about like what what she's seen from you know uh, uh, the different parties you work with. Mm -hmm. It's such a it's interesting. I find that that architect's comment, that Oregon architect's comment so cynical. Um, but no, so I have built some houses from 14 sheets, um, you know, $4 million houses on 14 sheets. And the two that I'm building right now have 90 sheets each. So um, it's, yeah, you, you can do both ways, but you certainly are putting a lot more trust into your builder. And I mean, the I'm lucky the, the, the groups that I work for and with, we, I mean, we build a pretty great house, um, but we also care too much, you know, and not everybody cares too much um, in the, in the construction in industry. Um, I think overall, like just thinking about um, from the perspective of, of how much do you draw, there's really, you're thinking about the, the two goals that you have. Um, is the builder gonna be bidding it accurately um, and completely, um, and then are they going to be building it correctly? And I guess again to to reference back to that who I call a cynical architect, how much do you care? Um, and I mean, realistically, how much fee have you built in for yourself right. to do so? I know that I mean, I I have worked for a few different architects, and right before I switched over to construction seven years ago, I was working with um, Christy Seals doing, you know, small renovations in, in Allendale. So I know that there's not always that much fee for that, but there's also, you guys sometimes don't build in that much fee for CA. So should you spend a little bit more time on the front end um, drawing a little bit more just to, um, cause that's when the, the client's still eager to pay those bills and those later on CA bills, they may not be as eager to, um, to be paying for. So, um, for me, I'm, I think I'm more comfortable talking about kind of what do you draw for construction, just because it's actually been a few months since I've bid any projects out. Um, I mean, I think one thing to think about when you're bidding is hopefully you're bringing a contractor on in that DD phase. And certainly at that point, you can get by with a DD level kind of, I don't know, 70% set. But I would really encourage you at that point to have your specifications at a like 95% level, if you can. I mean, I know there's going to be like Sean was talking about, there's certainly going to be um, a VE happening with different window packages, et cetera. But, um, but those things that are really important to you, I hope that you already have those in there. And if you can't quite hone in on a, um, a spec, at least listing some realistic allowances. So doing your homework that way, just so that um, your client isn't blindsided after that CD set comes out and all of a sudden you've thrown in, you know, actually this little window detail, I want to throw in all of this plate steel connection and it's just going to, it's going to sing, but there was no indication of stuff like that before. So um, 
I think that's where I'd recommend um, from the bidding point of view. But so for construction, yes, builders can build a, a beautiful house that may not be super highly detailed, but there may be those few really important moments to you in a 14 page set. Um, in the 90 page set that I'm working from, there are really two drawings I wanna talk about that have been just lifesavers. Um, and I think can transfer across any, um, any scale that you're working and drawing. The first one is an architectural foundation plan that also has the plumbing fixtures all indicated and dimensioned to an edge of slab. Um, you save us so much in terms of like uh, the ability to coordinate and also maybe think ahead a little bit further um, uh, into you know specific alignments. You don't, well, no, you do. You should probably have all of your plumbing fixtures specified by the time that we're breaking ground. Um, if you don't, okay, if it's gonna be a deck mounted faucet, who cares? And even if it's gonna be a wall mounted faucet, who cares? But tubs and um, toilets, um, what else hits the ground? Drains, Drains. island yeah. vents. Yeah, exactly. You should you should know where, where that's gonna fall. And you know, like we um, certainly, if you know you're going to use a linear drain, like we can, we can futz and sort of site build that um, that into place. But you should you should really know those kind of things because we need to rough in for them. Um, that drawing, also your um, uh, where your HVAC is, so that we can locate your condensate drains and um, also your floor outlets. So any of that kind of stuff. In you know, I was. Um, the the one that we're 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 doing form work right now for um, a house and we've got a lot of places where we have floor outlets long walls of glass and they want the floor outlet to land on a mullion well we haven't done the window shop drawings yet so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do leave outs that are eight inches wide by 24 inches long and the the um electrician will just pipe to those and we'll kind of dial that in later. But again, knowing kind of where you generally where you want all those things and, and the fact that you want those alignments, put those on an architectural um, uh, foundation plan. Well, also, I mean, obviously, when we're doing the foundation, we're going to refer to the structural constantly, but, you know, we work off of both. So. Right, and and you I mean you're you have that level of care in your work. Not not everyone does. Like um, I find in commercial work, the argument is, well, if you didn't draw it, too bad. How am I supposed to know? And so, you know, when you when you issue a set of drawings, um, if you don't have that note there, like a line or um, a special keynote saying the align floor boxes to mullions. Who knows where they'll come, you know, where, where, where they'll go. Um, and also the other thing with like slabs, especially uh, if you've got any floor systems, whether they're tile or uh, like bathroom drains or kitchen, commercial kitchen drains, you've got to show a slab depression. Otherwise, you can't get the slopes to work and the drainage to really, really happen. Um, so it's, I agree. I think the foundation plans, like it, crazy important. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, in, in especially if you have a steel, like if you have any structural steel with embeds or brace frames and laying out where those center lines occur. Um, I've found, you know, I've learned more from all like CA. That's that when the, when you go to the plumbing rough, you can tell how good a, uh, a contractor is by the questions they ask and how their waterproofing is under the slab and if they've got all the drains and have thought about all the vents. I can't tell you how many uh, commercial kitchens I've built in the last 10 years where they totally forget the drains for the hand sinks and um, or the plumbing engineer didn't put a island vent and so now all of a sudden we have this beautiful uh, open kitchen concept and we're having to add wet columns on the side of a, a tile wall because the plumber forgot to put the island vent uh, to those hand sinks and it sucks sometimes you just have to live with those or you've got to have that conversation about the change order to saw cut the slab out and and rework it all but um, yeah you, you've got to draw it yeah and I mean I've certainly learned over time that throwing an extra sleeve or three 
into a slab, like can never hurt or through a, you know, concrete stem wall. Um, so, you know, on our end, we, we learn every time as well and, and try to, um, try to cover, um, any kind of instances like that, but yeah, you can't, you can't know what, what you missed. You can't know what you don't see. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other area when it comes to framing, um, the other drawing that just was just like a godsend on on this other house um, was a framing plan that tried to coordinate um, like a, a ceiling slash roof line, really just ceiling because um, you know either way uh, first floor second floor um, that tries to coordinate especially in a house this complex if you've got um, mechanical drawings or and commercially if you've got uh, mechanical drawings and um, uh, but a coordinated architectural framing plan for ceilings so that those um, alignments, again, if it's really important to you to have, you know, all of your lights hitting exactly right and all of your ducts hitting exactly right and you've got a really thin floor plate and you need to make it all work, try to try to do that drawing. And so I think it's one of those where for the set that I'm working on, you know, we had the architectural framing plan, we had an RCP and we had a lighting sheet. I think it's possible to do all of that into one, um, certainly. Um, and I'll tell you why that drawing really helped. So on this particular project, the, the mid floor, the basically this is like an inverted house. So the main living is all happening upstairs and then um, bedrooms and auxiliaries downstairs. That middle floor plate is 24 inch trusses. There were 41 different unique truss types just in that mid floor. So, you know, 90, 100 trusses, but 41 unique ones. Because of that drawing and, and obviously spending some time with the shop drawings, referring to that drawing, we didn't have to do any field modifications to those trusses. Um, and that's a huge time saver um, for everybody and, you know, lack of change orders for the client, it's great. Um, so the information on that is, you know, you know from your structural engineer what your trusses will be or your TJIs or, um, you know, even stick framing, whatever you're using. So just try to take the time to dimensionally lay that out. Hopefully you've got a good idea of what your uh, can lights will be. Um, I will make a plug right now. I know it's like, I'm not selling a product, but the, the, can lights that we're using um, on both of the houses I'm working on are uh, DMF is the manufacturer. The housing is just the, the octagonal sort of unit that the light is gonna go into. There's no major box or anything around it. It's been amazing because we haven't had to reframe anything to make one of those massive housings work. And they're IC rated and, and lots of options on the trims and everything. Um, I, I bet they're not the only ones doing that now, but, um, that's been amazing. Um, but anyway, so that, that, uh, architectural framing plan, um, has just been a really important drawing. And I think, again, you can incorporate that into your RCP and lighting electrical, um, hopefully. I have a question for you on the trust shop drawing. So, yeah. um, you know, generally speaking, when I receive trust drawing from a manufacturer, you know, they just start on the right and go to the left or vice versa, you know, and just 24 inches on center. Yep. Um, so then, you know, I've got to go back and, and kind of tell them, okay, no, we need to start here. Here's maybe my generation line and we're going to go out two feet from there so that I can make all the lighting, just what you just described work out. Do you, so in, in your situation, is the architect coordinating the revisions to the shop drawings, reviewing the shop drawings, or are you, as the, as the contractor, sort of taking on that responsibility and communicating with the, the trust manufacturer about their shop drawings? Square one is that we sent the trust manufacturer the architect's AutoCAD or DWG file. Um, Got it that had that, and it probably was that architectural framing plan, DWG. 
Okay, that, so the trusses important. were actually already laid out in CAD at, in a mm -hmm. drawing to say, this is where we need them, then they could take from there. And Okay. Yeah, because of the complex geometries, there were some that these are nine inches on center, and then this one's 12, and then this one's 24, and this one's 20. So, sure. Yeah. So, starting point was the DWG direct from the, the architect. So, Got it. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think we had probably three revision rounds um, on those total. Um, but yeah, starting from the right starting point, certainly. Sure. That. Yeah. Sure. That's great. That's a great trust manufacturer. But also like that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's the, it's, it, that was Trustmate through Eastside Lumber. You know, okay. I mean, I know what is it, either BMC or them pretty much in town. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, but that, I mean, that was a lot of work on our part, but it also, again, you kind of, you pick your battle. So you pick where, sure. where is it really important to put energy into. And that was a, that was a time that's really important to put energy into. So. Right. But yeah. that, that, that's such a good point. It's like, what battles do you want to pick? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I it, it's amazing. I, I've been on some projects where we have 120 pages and, and a lot of interior details and it's everything is drawn. And sometimes it's so overwhelming. I mean, I can't imagine being a contractor having to, you know, find where's Waldo and what rabbit hole and what sheet that maybe someone added a note on. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to be in their shoes um, and, and then have to uh, sometimes go backwards on a project to fix something. Um, sometimes they won't go backwards. Um, but, you know, it, the question becomes like, what level of detail do you draw? Um, one project, you know, we drew leather cabinet poles you know, with different color stitching so that that got priced. If we didn't, it wasn't going to end up on the job. Now it was incredibly uh, intensive and thorough and um, it took a lot of work to get there, you know, even to help the contractors get there. But we could always say in that commercial project that at least it was drawn. Um, I found that I couldn't keep living that way, especially doing our, uh, the production of a project that way. Like I, I was going to die if I had to keep doing those kind of projects. Um, so I, I just kind of changed my mindset about how much do you draw and can you draw one detail that gets applied 60 different places, you know, and that's a pretty effective detail or is there a joint that you care about draw that. Um, but you don't have to draw everything and that kind of, um, change the mindset to sort of focus on the key things that were important to you or at you as the designer. Um, and then that became kind of powerful information to talk to the contractor about and say, listen, I don't care about this kind of stuff, but I care about these few things. And they then can get on your team and understand that when they get to those areas, they can have a pre-construction meeting. They can involve you with the various trades that are involved and help you help them succeed. And so it, it's kind of a different way of thinking, but um, uh, it, we, we don't usually get people like Brett on a commercial job who care that much. You, know, you, you usually get one round of shop drawings. If you get shop drawings, sometimes you get people who just say, oh, it, we're doing what was on the drawings, which is, which is terrifying because you, you don't get a chance to confirm, but um, yeah, it, there is so much involved, uh, um, and and uh, someone wrote a question here about uh, lit like lack of craftsmanship, and it's like you in commercial work. Like what I love about what what Brett and Eric do, um, in in a lot of the residential designers in, in Austin, they have a great uh, uh, community of great builders, and those people care a lot. Um, it's rare that you get that kind of detail in commercial work. You know, usually you're trying to just get a project built and meet a budget. And um, you don't oftentimes have control over where the drawings go uh, or who the client um, ultimately selects. So sometimes you've got to deal with their level of care or uh, craftsmanship and how to uh, help them get through the process. Um, well, Scott, I, I have a, oh, go ahead, Brett. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna ask Scott if you, you know, 
true. I, I think that was a great illustration, Brett, of sort of these what you what you value in terms of these kind of critical drawings being kind of the foundation plan with additional information, the framing plan. I mean, is there something from the architectural side, Scott, for you that you feel is kind of some critical, important drawings that you always include in your sets, no matter what, or a thesis that you have about, well, if I'm, if I'm going to get one thing done, it's going to be, it's going to be this, uh, and this will set the tone for, for the rest of the project. Is that, does that um, make sense? You know, yeah, I, uh, it's kind of a stylistic thing. I think everyone's a little different for what they focus on. Um, I, I found um, in previous offices that I worked in, you know, we were drawing window details at like one and a half inch scale or even three inch equals one foot scale. And you can't see all the pieces. You can't see the waterproofing. You can't see the nail flange. You can't see all the stuff. And, and you know, either you're going to be sending a drawing revision later to clarify that during construction um or you just draw it bigger and figure it out when you're when you're doing it so i i've kind of my methodology is like you can always draw things bigger and uh i don't care about paper you know i'd rather the information be clear so that someone can actually see it and so most of where i i try to do is i try to do more diagrammatic sections like building sections but then i jump to like half inch three quarter inch full sections through parts of the building just to really make that clear. And then we'll even jump to half inch scale drawings or, or half, half scale drawings. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, you know, it, it, when you see those things up close, you realize like the, the screw has a, a pan head on it, which is an eighth of an inch thick. And that's going to affect all these other finishes, just that little bit. So you've got to add shims or MDF and, you know, there's a lot of little little things that can mess up your um, your alignments, and so it's just something to think through um, and 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 kind of push your push your level of detail in your work. Um, at least I found that helped that helped me a lot. Yeah, and I would recommend just from this is this is sort of the the undergrad design teacher side of me too is. Um, when you're dimensioning, when you're dimensioning anything, dimension to framing, please. Yeah. Up until up until your cabinetry details, which are going to be the cabinets will go in when they're sheetrock. Dimension everything to framing. Dimension nothing to sheetrock. Um, and then with those those you know half scale details that you're drawing, reference those back to a framing moment. Like if it's a section, reference that back, especially if you're talking about like a building envelope kind of detail, reference it back to a top plate or a nearby exposed column line, not one that's, you know, hidden behind walls now, but um, somewhere relevant nearby um, that we can easily find. Cause that's, that is the one frustration I have is like, there's an Eve detail that I've been working on. There's no, <laughs> there's no dimension back in the X and it's like, where is this supposed to fall? And that's been challenging. Right. So, yeah. Um, but I'd love to, I mean, I know from my own household, I'm in a mixed architect household. Um, I know that this stuff is, is really frustrating and, and, and especially in the CA side about dealing with, and I don't even, I don't even know the right terminology. What are the submittals that are like kind of manufacturer submittals a, a little bit like what three times Nielsen was, uh, like doing. informational like for for or, uh, yeah or just it, maybe it's more like those design build type contracts where you're relying a lot on your subs to come up with a design at the same time oh, those aren't oh, some it's that, like prescriptive <laughs> prescriptive or performance yeah. based yeah yeah those sort of performance submittals but um but i'd be interested to kind of open up the conversation at this point i mean we're halfway through the time um Oh, someone, yeah, someone well, asked. The, yeah, I mean, someone asked a question about mock-ups in. in oh the, yeah, uh, Randy. Not, so, yeah, I think mock-ups. As long as you are specifying early on in that bidding phase, what what mock-ups you want on the on the landscape side. Um, certainly, the landscape architects that we've been working with make a whole sheet out of we want mock-up of X Y Z. Um, and so, as long as the contractor can plan for that budgetarily. Those are great. I mean, so many, so many decisions and changes get made in a mock-up phase. And as long as 
the contractor has budgeted for sort of those unknowns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great way to go. If you're going to be really involved in the CA phase. That's true. Yeah. I mean, um, some people aren't like, I, I think about like, um, I was talking to someone the other day about how they're just doing houses for, for contractors to like builders set builder set. Right. So what's that 12 sheets or, um, the basic drawings to get through permit, um, uh, with, with the local jurisdiction. And yeah, oftentimes there aren't window details and things like that. Um, but, um, kind of circling back to the mock-up question, um, not every job can afford them. That's, yeah. that's the other thing. Um, yeah. you know, contractors are cutting like your tile on my projects to FRP, which sucks. And, but it's like inevitable. And, um, and like the other thing is like, oh, the line item for the mock-up, eh, let's just cut that. And <laughs> it's, it's easy money to cut, um, especially when you're over budget or behind schedule. Um, but yeah, mock-ups are great for everybody, especially if you're doing something unconventional or you've got tricky situations, uh, especially if you're doing stucco, mm -hmm. do a mock-up. 99% of people don't know how to flash a stucco window or waterproof one. Um, and that's where there are a lot of litigious issues in stucco. Um, uh, I had one office, we, we did a corporate headquarters for uh, Intuit when I was an intern. And we had five buildings we detailed with a very similar uh, series of details. And our window uh, sill flashing was wrong and they, we didn't have weeps on it. So there were 74 leaks in one building. Um, overall, there were 400 window failures on a brand new building, all because of one bad detail. So always do a mock-up, especially at that kind of scale, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, I have a I have a question okay. or to pose out there, because I, I think sometimes, you know, you can be, Let's say, for example, you're using a particular stucco system and, you know, instead of drawing the detail, you might just say to be installed per the manufacturer's specifications. So, you know, when, when is it appropriate to kind of dig in and understand the detail enough to be able to kind of recreate it in your set of drawings versus just putting a note that says, oh, this is this is not on me anymore. You, Mr. Contractor, Mrs. Contractor, follow the follow the uh, the contractors, or the, I'm sorry, the manufacturer's specifications, and sort of put the onus on on them to go find out what that detail actually is. Yes and no. I mean, it depends. Like, there's different kinds of stucco, right? There's synthetic, and then there's real plaster stucco. Mm -hmm. The real plaster stucco guys don't give you any of those drawings for, for a reason. Uh, it also depends on what kind of like lath you're using, screwed fasteners versus staple fasteners versus expansion, all the bits and pieces that, that go into that system. Um, there's actually lots of different companies involved besides one source. Now, when you talk about synthetic stucco, like... Um, uh, Stowe or uh, uh, Ephus or uh, Dur uh, Drive It if they're still around, like that's a system. They've all been sued to death by multiple countries that they've had to publish those details. And that's why, um, that's why you can put that note on your drawings that says deferred <laughs> with manufacturer specifications. But if you're doing stucco, oh gosh, I mean, there's, you can get real crazy with stucco real, and get real, real bad real fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, Adam. Hey, Adam. Um, do y'all like to see diagrams and renderings from the architect when you get to the build on certain things? Yeah. Love it. Um, if it's a, a, an architectural, you know, detail that you really want to celebrate, like a, some sort of column connection or a cabinetry connection, or if it's just a really complex interface that even when, when you look at the drawings, you get confused. <laughs> you can count on the fact that the, the architect, or sorry, that the builder is not going to be able to anticipate, you know, what you mean on um, 
you know, in, in 3D and in X and Y. So, yeah. And so, for example, like a lot of the um, uh, architectural steel um, that we're doing, I mean, Matt Satter loves seeing a rendering to just at, at, over at Dropouse, like love seeing a rendering to um, just quickly get to the to the heart of the matter. And it, it's really great for us because a lot of our subs, um, you know, they're not that great at reading drawings sometimes. Um, so being able to show what the overall intent is to, to allow your builder to advocate for you and advocate for your detail. Yeah, I would say um, that's a good use of your time rather than a planned section elevation sometimes on certain details. Um, great question, Adam. That's a great question. I, they're one of my favorite, uh, there's a SketchUp um, YouTube video where they interviewed Allied Works about the construction of the Clifford Still Museum and how they use SketchUp. I mean, it's a pretty primitive tool, but you know they're doing high level work with a primitive tool. Um, but what they do um, after they start working in the documentations is they build a 3D model and then they start dissecting all the intersections in 3D and then they start developing the details and they actually have like a series of how all those pieces come together three dimensionally that help inform the contractors and how all those pieces are to resolve, which is incredible if you have that time, but uh, if there's a great little YouTube about it. Yeah, we actually have we have SketchUp models on these two Alter Studio houses. Now, granted, they're not running. I think they're just starting to run Revit, so I'm sure some of that work is a little bit redundant. But I admit I'm kind of a luddite. I got out of drawing right when Revit was coming to, so I left myself a SketchUp model because I'm kind of back in that technological mind frame. Um, but it's it it can be really helpful. Um, before See, we Cam, jump to yeah. oh, go ahead. I love, I, I like Cam's question a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So do you have a list of most useless drawings? Um, I do, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if, if Scott or Sean, you want to jump in? Take first. it. Go ahead. Um, interior elevations. <laughs> if it's a wall with a cased opening, don't, don't worry about it. On your detail sheet, draw a single base detail draw a casing detail for any kind of door type that you have. Just do that in a detail. Um, interior elevations are for cabinet shops. Like just go to town on that. Or if there's hardware that's mounting on a wall, light fixture on a wall, um, uh, robe hooks, that kind of stuff. That's where that information is really helpful. But if you're gonna just draw a picture of a wall with a case opening, and so what about uh, what about framing information? Do you do you see sets that have a lot of framing information in the interior elevations in terms of you know fur downs and you know things shapes that you're creating with walls that that are you can't really show that in a yeah I mean uh, I obviously you can show it in the building in, section but in your building sections yeah let that happen in your building section and zoom into a, a specialty wall section at that point and give us a dimension above slab or a dimension above subfloor for that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you really, unless there's, again, unless there's like this cabinetry alignment that you're trying to hit, sure. maybe, but I think that you can take care of all of that in your building sections. Yeah, yeah. Cam also asked an earlier question about um, lack of crap craftsmanship or abundance of litigation I guess just kind of going back to you know I will maybe just the, the general question of how much do you draw so um yeah I mean I guess Scott you've kind of addressed litigation in terms of that stucco detail so knowing knowing what you're doing so you don't open yourself up for for failures to occur but you got more to say okay. in, the in the same sense though if you have someone who cares like some trades will care more than others because they realize it's a shared endeavor. You know, like no one wants a call back. No one wants to have to redo work or lose money on a job or get lawyers involved. Uh, like, so I've had some like glazing contractors who were hyper involved, you know, and they would, they would correct your details and, or they request a mock-up. Um, uh, or some stucco people would be very thorough about their submittal packages about all the parts and pieces and then be insistent about 
you know, flashings and working through that with the GC and maybe a sheet metal uh, company. Um, but it really, it's really up to the individual who's, who's driving that ship. Um, uh, right now I'm working with one general contractor who I love, commercial general contractor, and he'll call me about what color screws I want to use. I've never had that happen. You know, it's in, it, but like, I'm sure in like, a, you know, Brett uh, would care a lot about that, you know, and her team. And so it's like, it's, it's just a different, it just depends on who you get in commercial. Uh, you, you don't always have uh, um, that caliber on every job. Sure. Um, let's see, Luis just posed an interesting question about, you know, just having having extra information. We're talking about kind of these special renderings, uh, going the extra mile to really kind of make these details understood uh, to those that are executing them in the field. But a great question about, you know, how, how do you how do you reconcile your fees with the amount of extra time that it would take to to do those? And I I mean I guess that's just just based on every project, right? I mean if you're if you're building the Clifford Still Museum, I suppose maybe you've got maybe Allied Works has enough fee in there to kind of understand that they're going to take their their construction drawings to a certain level that's going to require them to have a pretty hefty hefty fee um but i know not 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 well it's probably rare for people to to work in a in a in an architectural world of billing that allows you to have kind of the the freedom to to do all you know to to go that extra that extra mile um I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Brett, in terms of, you know, the drawings that you're, you're getting, obviously, if you've got kind of a 90 page set of drawings, you've got a SketchUp model, there's line items for mock-ups. Um, obviously, maybe that, that architect has kind of been able to sort of stretch their wings a little bit on their fees in order to kind of incorporate that, but obviously sell that to the client to say, well, you know, it's, it's going to be incredible when it's done because we, we you know, we've, we've got all this time and, and, uh, we can put a, a ton of effort into making sure that our intent is very clear to all of the people that are going to be building it. So are you having those types of conversations on the contracting side with the architect? Certainly, or I mean, because we always have to, you know, we have to justify every dollar that's being spent to our homeowners. Um, yeah. You know, we, we are fortunate that we have very involved um, clients and, you know, these are big budget projects, but nobody's, nobody that we work with has an unlimited ceiling. Right. So uh, right. one of the ways that we justify it um, is that actually the the more robust those drawings, the I think it actually really helps the construction schedule. There's not those lags for us to say, oh, let's stop, let's do that RFI, let's, you know, this information has never been shown. So we have to wait for the architect to kind of generate that. And that's, a, that's an additional fee, an additional services fee um, versus the architect. Maybe it's even a detail or, or a note that's not fully fleshed out, but it's made it into the set. And mm -hmm. so half the battle is already done that that conversation were like the, the contractor is already having to think about it a little bit and maybe come up with some um, solutions. So that there may still need to be a quick phone call. Hey, what do you think about doing X, Y, Z versus RFI emailed? We need a detail for this area done. Um, so a little bit of streamline on schedule. Um, also, one thing building right now is really hard because of the, as um, uh, a vendor that I work with has said, the world of available things it's a real thing right now that yeah. the specialty pro products that you have always gotten to use, chances are they don't exist right now or we can't get them for 14 weeks. So if there's something really special, you need to justify it to your client and say, I really want this in here. I think you are really going to appreciate this. I've got to, I've got to take the time to draw it because they've got to get it ordered right away. I mean, that's, that's the reality of, of pandemic building right now. So. The, the, 90, the 90 page set, what, what, how many pages do you think it was when you priced it? If you had to guess. It was 89. It was 89. Okay, yeah. so they, yeah. you, they got to go kind of the full, cause that's another 
you know, that's another balance too, as well. How, how much do you draw in terms of how much can you get paid <laughs> to draw before, mm-hmm. before you, you have to kind of understand how much the building is going to cost because it's difficult to give a contractor a half-baked set of drawings that you hope you can get enough information to get the general scheme of, of how much it's going to cost. But knowing that, you know, it's, it's inevitably going to get more expensive um, just because there's going to be more information uh, coming, you know, down the line. So that's, that's great to hear that, that you come kind of had a complete set of drawings from, from which to, to price. And I mean, I again, mean, like <laughs> at DD, you're, you're not going to have all those decisions made, but again, sort of those allowance placeholders or those just sort of like generic detail here that gets a little further flushed out. I know, I mean, I, I know that that's a lot to ask of, especially if you, you've got sort of small clients and you're in residential and it's it's their first and only build or it's their first and only renovation addition. I know that's hard um, yeah. to, to justify, but again, I think that um, explaining the benefits that you, that they can have on the construction side that, cause I know everyone, not everyone, but um we all know and we've all experienced like the pain of a really bad build you know you you yeah. want your you want to encourage and steer your clients towards contractors that will make it an enjoyable process and part of it is that they're armed with good information so sure i love that idea i mean that it's okay to issue something that's not fully resolved as long as everyone knows what's not fully resolved like it, or doing allowances or identifying like here are the gaps, but we need to solve these. Um, I, I think it's real painful for everyone to have to deal with new sets of drawings during construction. Cause you have to realize when you hit control P and send those, like you're just adding frustration and money and time to a project. Um, whether it's an ASI, like, you know, a change order or um, showing up to the job site and realizing that that information didn't get to all the subcontractors and they're all building from different drawing sets and it can be a nightmare. And so I, I'm a big fan of drawing everything first and, uh, and, and trying to limit new information during construction to just clarifications, you know, if you can, or, or, or dealing with, uh, um, adjustments that are needed in the field. Um, it's just, you know, try to stand in their shoes and understand like you, you, you know what it is in 3D that you're trying to build and somehow they have to interpret all of your 2D drawings and build it. It's, 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 a, it's a daunting task. Mm-hmm. I think there's always that lingering fear of just, okay, well, if I draw, uh, what, what I would like to do is draw everything, specify everything so that when we understand how much this thing's gonna cost, you know, it's all, it's all there, but then the fear, obviously that, well, it's way too much. And so now you've kind of, now you go through the value engineering process and you've got to change, you know, all of your drawings because you, you've had to, you've had to, you know, change window manufacturer because the, either that window package is, you know, not the lead time, especially with today's environment is not realistic for the project anymore. Um, or it's, you know, way too expensive and you've got to find a less expensive alternative, but yet all those kind of three or six inch details that you drew to make sure that you kind of got that into the set so that it was priced and understood or now, you know, but that they, can they be resolved, but that can be resolved with one ASK or one sketch, you know, one yeah. eight by 11 that just Clar- says, clarification. Yeah. yeah, this, this, you don't have to redraw, um, but you need to make sure that you have a partner in your builder. And I'd also, I'd, I'd kind of kick it back to the architect a little bit as a shame on you for not talking, not, not befriending a builder, you know? I mean, I know, I know that people, architects fall into um, sort of comfort cycles of they always have the same two or three builders kind of do their projects take that builder to coffee or a beer or something um, every once in a while and just catch up because, um, you know, we like coffee and beer and, uh, <laughs> and stuff is changing a lot, but, but I think that it's definitely the job of the architect to stay informed on what's happening in the market. 
Yeah. So, so then you're, you're just saying you've got to bring, you've got to get involved earlier on the construction side and it start a dialogue so you can be like, Hey, uh, well, how much is this going to cost? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, should I draw this? Should I not draw this? And having that frank conversation really early on with your client, with a homeowner about what is your real budget? Is this going to be a bank finance thing? Is this being financed by so-and-so's grandmother and, and all that? I mean, we have to have those conversations with them. So you can too, um, to just make sure that you're designing, you know, I think it's always good to be striving um, and maybe pushing your clients to, to want more than they expect, um, or, you know, they wouldn't be hiring an architect if they, if they weren't going to entrust your creativity to bring a little more to the picture than what, what they could, could sketch, sure. but it's not an easy conversation. I hate money conversations. I'm getting a lot better at them now, but you are doing all of your hard work a disservice if you're just starting to draw and you haven't been brave enough to have that really candid conversation with them. Sure. That's well, a great point. And, and that conversation can come up early. Like, is this, is this a project that you're going to showcase or is this uh, a project where you're drafting for dollars as an architect, you know, like make those decisions, ask that, you know, like, what is that client really asking of you? Are they asking for like your signature or beautiful artwork uh, like your masterpiece, or are they just saying, I just need an office built, draw it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it, those are different buckets. You know, I think architects oftentimes dream a lot that every project is going to be an architectural record or art daily. They don't all have to be. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can have that conversation early on and that can help you save your time, draw what's important and help you make more money. And it, you just, be effective, right? But a lot of it comes down to communication. Sure. Although I will say that I I do I, I I do have those conversations, but it's 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 still hard to keep clients in line in terms of what their what their desires are, their goals are, right? It's kind of like they say something and you say, well, I'm just not sure that's really going to be in the stated budget or sort of what the goals are, and then they listen to that, and then a week later they come back and say, well, we want those, you know, we want to move from uh, this line of windows because they have standard eight foot doors to this other more expensive line because they have nine foot doors. And we really think a nine foot door would be better than an eight foot door. It's kind of like, well, I, we already had this conversation, you know, you that's that window package is 40% more than, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's tough to kind of like drive the bus, but also have people that are telling you to, you know, veer off on to this path, this other path constantly, so I just haven't, I don't know. Um, well, did you, did you charge them more money to redraw the details or did you just go with it? Uh, I mean, honestly, I just end up usually end up just going with it, you know, and just, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to fee structure, which is a separate conversation. Sure. Next are week, you, or next are month. you lump sum? <laughs> are you hourly? Are you percentage based? Uh, who is your client? Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you could lose all of your money drawing, you know, if you draw too much and then you get to CA and you have no money. And part of that's your own fault. Yeah. I mean, you either manage yourself and the information or you don't. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a tricky slope as an architect. So, I, sure. you know, that, but that's a separate conversation. Yeah. Randy, I see your comment and thank you for that. I meant to say something earlier. Um, so Randy made that comment that contingencies are critical to build into the budget. Absolutely. And when um, when you guys asked, you know, how many sheets were there already in this one set? And I said 89, they still reissued an entire set afterwards that we knew was coming. And so the the initial budget that that you know we're able to make from DD is. I think it's a really good thing for you to make sure that your builder has, you know, with new construction, at least a 10% contingency in there, maybe even a 15% contingency in there. If you know that you haven't gotten to draw everything, because we will, we'll maybe go to contract with the client at that point, just, you know, to, to um, do like a pre-construction agreement um, at that point, but we are going to reprice it 
throughout and we will hone in and tighten up their budget and lessen that contingency percentage every round as more details come. With renovation addition, I mean, heck, that builder might want to have a 25% contingency in for that initial initial budgeting. And then again, after pulling down some, some sheetrock and poking up into the attic, well, they should be doing that before they're issuing a budget anyway. Um, but the a, a good builder should be starting high and communicating very clearly with your client about I'm starting this contingency high um, and we will start to we'll, we'll hone that in and really dial that in as we get more and more information but but you know we need again from a builder side we need to be having really very realistic um, conversations with your client um, and and keeping that contingency um, conversation that's a real useful tool so yeah Oh, contingency. Oh, <laughs> I love to have a contingency. Um, oftentimes on, on like a lot of the bid projects I work on, um, the bankers won't fund it. They'll, they'll cross it out and you're like, oh shit, there's no cushion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and, and that happens. Yeah. That happens a lot. And hopefully the client can have a cash contingency on the side to dial into because yeah that's a really complicated one to deal with um when you're having especially a construction loan that requires on-site inspections for every draw mm -hmm. yeah 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 but yeah i agree I, I think contingencies are always needed uh my to quote a commercial contractor here in town if it's a new construction project you should be between five to ten percent because that's typically where all the change orders and mistakes in the documents lead to. Um, and then if it's a renovation somewhere around the 20 to 25% contingency, but if you're doing a million dollar project or $2 million project, not everyone can finance that additional amount of money, you know? Um, so it's, it's tricky. Um, but the bankers also have a vested interest in wanting to see a project completed because they don't want to have a half done building that they can't turn around and sell or um, that sits there and can't accrue money for them, you know, in, in terms of an, as an investment. So um, yeah, contingencies always, always fight for them. Cool. Well, on that note, it sounds like a call to arms. <laughs> Um, it's uh, we're approaching one o'clock here, so I just want to open up um, maybe the floor for one more question from our audience. If anybody has uh, one more thing they would like to sort of throw out there for our guests here, otherwise, um, I think obviously we could keep talking about this for hours. I think personally, I've sort of taken away a couple of nuggets of key information from both Scott and Brett today. That I that I can take into my own way of thinking and my own my own practice, um, and hopefully not spend all of my fee <laughs> drawing, which I'm horrible at. Um, but uh, I hope that I hope that everyone else here is, has has uh, been able to latch on to some information that they can take into their practices as well. Uh, I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your days to join us and. Be candid with your information and experiences. Um, very, very helpful. It's always nice to just get to hear what other, what other architects and contractors are up to and what what they're experiencing right now. So it, it serves to bring a lot of perspective to, to, to at least me, and I hope I hope everyone else as well. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brett, for joining. Bye. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, Bye. yeah, okay. we're good. <laughs> <laughs>